Grave Trigger is a skirmish and campaign game that takes place in a world grotesquely mutated by humanity, where resources are rare, and reclaiming technology is the difference between life and death. You battle using Animus Reactors, sentient, parasitic power armor that absorbs its human host in exchange for terrifying strength. In this video, you'll learn the basics for Grave Trigger. Before we jump into gameplay, here are some quick explainers. Before the game begins, each player must choose their vector, a group of three or more Animus Reactors with weapons, damage states, and ultimates chosen for each. Characters also belong to different drives, factions that grant a unique set of passives, abilities, and achievements. Your vector can be deeply customized, from the weapons you equip for each battle, to the damage states and ultimates you secretly assign, to mixing characters from different drives. There are three key character stats to track in-game, Torque, Damage, and Animus Points. Torque represents the extreme toll that movement and impact takes on the human body inside the Animus. Attacks will often inflict Torque as well as damage, and most reactions cost Torque to use. When a character is out of cover, any damage inflicted to them will cause a Torque Burst, which will instantly convert all Torque on their tracker into damage. Characters who have a full Torque limit may not be able to use reactions or abilities because they can't pay the cost. Damage is tracked starting from zero up to a character's limit. As a character takes damage, different damage states are triggered. These events, which are secretly chosen by the player before the game begins, grant powerful one-time effects or permanent new abilities. When the character reaches their damage limit, the ultimate that you've chosen for them is revealed, creating a massive, game-changing impact before the character is removed from the battlefield. Animus points are gained whenever characters take damage. Each point of damage grants one Animus point, which can be used to activate abilities available on character cards. Once an Animus point is spent, it cannot be regained. Once the battle begins, there are three phases in each round. Order, Action, and the End phase. In the Order phase, players determine the movement and potential actions for each of their characters in reverse initiative order. In the Action phase, everything decided upon in the Order phase takes place in initiative order. Characters inflict damage, reach objectives, and fight to survive. The end phase gives characters a short respite from battle, as tokens are resolved, initiative is reset, and the battlefield is prepared for the next round. The only tool you'll need for measurements is the reach gauge. Ranges come in three values, reach one, reach two, and reach three. In this gameplay walkthrough, you'll see two rounds of the Chrono Class starter set battle against the Discordia starter set, using the demo scenario, Tracking the Breach. For days, your animus has been forcing your attention towards this place. What started as a whisper in your ear became a roar inside your mind, demanding that you take action. Now that you've arrived, the air here is unsettling. What's left of your lungs churns across the interior of your armor with each breath. The atmosphere roils with energy, on the cusp of overflowing. Several powerful forces are fighting to breach into your world. They will all manifest at this point. You can't stop them all, or draw them all in. But decoding their volatile nature will let you know which is the greatest threat, and if that threat can be used against your enemies. During setup, priority for starting initiative and battlefield deployment is determined rock, paper, scissors style, using the combat, control, and animus order cards. The Chrono class choose and reveal a combat order card, beating the Discordia's control order card and winning priority. The Chrono class choose to take initiative, placing Ashima's initiative marker at the top of the track. The Discordia respond by claiming a deployment zone and placing Gavora onto the battlefield. Setup continues until all initiative positions are claimed and all characters have been deployed. In this scenario, objectives can be interacted with beginning in round two, and the choices made at those objectives will determine the win condition. In reverse initiative order, each character places their movement token at any distance within line of sight. They'll also choose an order, combat, control, or animus, that will dictate which actions and reactions are available. This order remains secret until revealed by the player in the next phase. At the top of initiative order, Ashima activates. They're within reach two of the structural terrain that has their movement token on it, 
allowing them to run up the side of the building and into base contact with it. Once perched, they can still use their agility of three, but they find they're too far to leap towards Objective B. As they're taking no action, they don't reveal their order card. Yasod activates next, dashing forward towards their movement token, sidestepping with their agility and revealing a combat order. They measure the barrier in front of them, confirming its medium-sized scatter terrain, and choose to execute a terrain attack. They lower their initiative by two on the tracker and choose a target point in line of sight, directly between Moloch and Bale. The two chronoclasts choose not to react, so their orders remain secret. Yasod whips the barrier across the battlefield, causing an impact that pushes both chronoclasts away and inflicting two torque to each of them. Moloch moves up, reveals a combat order, lowers their initiative by one, and hurls volatile scatter terrain back at Yasod. It bursts apart, creating a volatile one marker, so that any character who executes an action or reaction within reach one of it will gain a stun token, which will lower them by one on the initiative tracker at the beginning of the next phase. Gavora activates, moving to objective C, using their agility to pivot, and then revealing a combat order. They lower two initiative positions to target Bale with their wire blade. The barrier between them grants Bale cover, protecting them from a torque burst, so Bale chooses not to react. The wire blade inflicts two damage and one torque, before pulling Bale into the barrier and inflicting an additional torque. As Bale can't pay the torque cost for reactions, Malkut seizes the opportunity, using their agility of two to get Bale within reach of their lance. They lower their initiative by two and strike Bale, inflicting two damage, two torque, and triggering Bale's first damage state. The damage state is revealed to be rematerialize, letting Bale immediately displace into base contact with a friendly character. They choose to displace next to Ashima on the roof of the adjacent building. Now in perfect position to get to the objective, Bale dives down, revealing a combat order to target Malkut with their weapon technique, Crushing Blow. Malkut blocks by paying two torque, which reduces incoming damage and torque in half, and grants them cover. Bale's heavy blade slices into Malkut and pushes them into the wall, inflicting three damage, one torque, and staggering Malkut, dropping them one initiative position. All initiative markers are reset. Each character recovers one torque, all temporary effects are ended, all tokens are removed from the battlefield, and the next round begins. With objectives now active, Ashima uses their movement and leaps across to the roof of the center building then uses their agility to be in base contact with the objective and reveals their control order. They choose the action, interact with the objective. As Ashima's uncontested, they're able to decode Objective B and secretly learn the following. This orphaned entity is pure killing intent. The sole survivor of its original timeline, it has become completely consumed by rage and sorrow and seeks to be weaponized to sate its bloodlust. As Bale has already taken significant damage, Ashima decides to close off the objective. Two objectives still remain. Moloch is next to activate. They move forward, use their agility to leap over the barrier in front of them, complete their movement, and reveal an Animus Order, which Moloch uses to install Warp Stinger, an ability which will inflict two damage to any enemy characters that cause Moloch to lower an initiative order. Yasod uses their agility to jump over the terrain in front of them, move next to Moloch, and reveal a Combat Order to target Moloch with their Chain Whip. This lowers Yasod's initiative by two. Because Moloch used an Animus Order, they can pay the costs to counter. This allows them to attack first, and then receive half damage from Yasod's attack. Moloch attacks with their sickle, boosting the damage by one with their passive Meat Grinder. Yasod takes two damage and one torque, and then Moloch takes one damage and two torque. But since they're out of cover, a torque burst is triggered, converting Moloch's five torque into five damage. 
which is then reduced to three due to them choosing the counter reaction. This triggers a damage state. Moloch reveals carapace growth, so that all damage and torque that's inflicted to them by enemy attacks is reduced by one until their next damage state is revealed. On the other side of the battlefield, Gavora moves to face Bale, reveals a combat order, and declares an attack on Bale with the wire blade, using the flash strike trait, which removes the initiative penalty for attacking, but inflicts two torque to Gavora. Bale can't afford the torque cost to react, so it inflicts two damage to them in one torque. Whenever a character is inflicted torque while they're already at their limit, they're staggered instead, dropping Bale one initiative position. The damage also triggers a torque burst, converting Bale's five torque to additional damage. This triggers another damage state. Bale reveals Painkiller Flood, a card that they can use on demand to not gain torque until the end of the current round. Bale is next to activate. They use agility to reposition so Gavora is between them and their movement token. They then spend five Animus points to use Void Blitz, an ability that lets them move through another character, displace them into base contact, and then push them up to reach three away. This sends Gavora crashing into the ruins, inflicting one torque. Bale follows up, lowering their initiative and attacking with their heavy blade. Gavora blocks, but Bale still inflicts three damage. Melkut is close enough to the building to jump up and land on top. They then use their agility to pivot within range of Ashima. Malkut reveals a combat order and declares an attack on Ashima with their lance, using the push one trait. Malkut's initiative is lowered by two. Ashima can pay the costs to use the evade control order reaction and dive off of the building and out of Malkut's reach, but they choose not to, because either way they'll have to gain three torque, but the damage that's inflicted to them will give them animus points, which can be used for their abilities. The attack inflicts two damage and two torque to Ashima and pushes them off of the structure. The fall is longer than reach three, causing one additional torque. Malkut capitalizes though, paying three Animus points to use their Brain Buster ability, which allows them to displace into base contact with Ashima and inflict three more torque. All initiative markers are again reset. Each character recovers one torque. All temporary effects are ended. All tokens are removed from the battlefield and the battle continues. Thank you for watching. Grave Trigger is live on Kickstarter. Check the link in the description to access the campaign and download the early access rulebook for free.